It occurred to me that we human beings are actually rather simple creatures. After about an hour and twenty minutes, a dark form began to take shape on the horizon ahead of us. Hey, there's Hawaii, I said to Kato, my backseater. Look out, Mr. Enemy, your blue eyeballs will soon be spinning. The Zeros dropped their external tanks and surged out ahead of us. They were tasked with hitting the enemy airfields and destroying as many planes on the ground as possible. We were now approaching the northwest tip of Oahu. I was acutely aware that the torpedo I was carrying would help decide the fate of my country, and I was determined to make a direct hit. We'll show them what the Japanese military can do, I said to myself. Just then we received the signal. Attack! Our squadron came screaming in from the northwest, aiming for Pearl Harbor. Down through passes in the Waiane Mountains we hurtled, zigzagging all the way. Flying low through the mountains is very dangerous, and we had to be especially careful. One mistake here and it would be all over. I saw some bunkers being built on the hillsides and wondered if the Americans were preparing for a Japanese invasion. This war was probably coming sooner or later, I thought. The bunkers reminded me of all those I saw on the front lines in China. We were coming down fast now. I concentrated on maintaining a 3,000 distance from the plane in front of me. Soon we were screaming along the deck at 150. Suddenly, Wheeler Field was right in front of us, just as our maps had shown. The bunkers had distracted me, and I didn't see the field until we were right over it. I could see what looked like 200 fighters lined up in front of their hangars. Damn, I thought. If they get those fighters up, they'll make short work of our torpedo planes. Still, I was impressed. I'd never seen so many fighters in one place on any of our army or navy fields. It occurred to me that there must be a big difference between a country that had so many planes and one that did not. But this was neither the time nor place for such ruminations. Looking up, I was relieved to see that our fighters and dive bombers were just waiting for us to clear the area so they could pounce. Still, it seemed like too good a chance to pass up. Hey, Hayakawa! I yelled at my gunner. Start shooting! As if anticipating my command, Hayakawa immediately cut loose with his rear gun. Those 7.7 minute slugs were the first fired in the Pearl Harbor attack. Hayakawa seemed to be having a great time blasting away with his machine gun, but I didn't see any planes catch fire. Strange, I thought. Maybe he's missing. While thus musing, I was careful to keep an eye on flight leader Nagai's plane. I wanted to be sure we were in the perfect position to make a successful attack. I couldn't let myself be distracted. I had to concentrate totally on our main target. Still, I wondered why those fighters weren't burning. He couldn't miss. But in a matter of seconds, Wheeler was behind us. Maury's rear gunner fired the first shots of the Pearl Harbor attack when he opened up on these P-40s at Wheeler Field, as Maury's planes screamed overhead at low level. Here they go up in flames later during the attack. Looking down, I noticed a car speeding towards the airfield along the long road leading from Pearl Harbor to Wheeler. Suddenly the car flipped upside down and ended up with its wheels in the air. Man, what a lousy driver, I thought. I couldn't imagine anyone wasting precious machine gun bullets on a car. The road was lined with pineapple fields. I remembered looking at pictures of this area on board the ship and joking that if we had a forced landing in a pineapple field, at least we wouldn't starve to death. Compared with the photos we'd seen, though, the actual scenery was much more spectacular. Ahead of us lay Pearl Harbor. It was Sunday, and the battleships and cruisers of the American Pacific Fleet were floating peacefully at anchor in the morning mist. The targets for our torpedo planes from the Soryu were the battleships and carriers moored to the wharves. We were surprised to find that the carriers, our main targets, were gone. They had left the harbour the day before. I was bitterly disappointed because I really wanted to slam a torpedo into the Saratoga or the Lexington. Well, I thought, we'll just sink every one of those battleships instead. As we closed on Pearl, the ship types became distinctly visible. 
However, although we had studied photos and diagrams of the ships for hours on end, the actual ships looked altogether different. It now seemed hard to believe that we were actually here to sink them. The battleships were moored together in pairs, and if they had placed torpedo nets on their exposed sides, we could never have torpedoed them. No doubt the US Navy had never in their wildest dreams imagined that our torpedo planes could manoeuvre and attack in such a confined space. Now the unimaginable was about to occur. In a few hours, the attack would be headline news in every corner of the globe, and people around the world would be in awe at our stupendous victory. While keeping an eye on Nagai's plane, I tried to confirm our target. From Wheeler to Pearl was a straight line, so the flying was easy. My altimeter was reading almost zero, but it looked like we were about 15 feet above the ground. I started breathing deeply and tried to calm my nerves. There was no time to think of anything other than the job at hand. My only thought was putting my torpedo into a battleship. As we reached our release point, I saw Nagai drop his torpedo. It was my turn next. As I aimed my aircraft at the ship, I saw a huge column of water rise up where Nagai's torpedo had impacted. Get ready to drop, I yelled at Kato. But just as I was about to pull the release, something didn't look right. That's no battleship, I thought. We were zooming along at 130 kts, and the distance to the ship was closing rapidly. At 200 yards, it was time to let my fish go. Then I realised it was much too short and narrow to be a battleship. It was a cruiser, probably Chicago. Nagai blew it. He came all this way only to torpedo the wrong ship. He has to apologise to our country for that mistake. We torpedo pilots were ordered to hit only carriers or battleships. I immediately shifted my sights to the battleship to the left. I had to make a steep turn at low level, and my left wingtip seemed only inches above the water. It was dangerous as hell, but it was the only way to get into position for an attack. We're going around, I yelled into the speaking tube to Coteau as I gunned the engine. During training they never mentioned the embankments, but there they were, in the way. Didn't matter, I had to make up for Nagai's mistake. I'm going to sink one of those big boys, I said to myself as I zoomed over the top of a battleship protected by a breakwater. It sounds easy, but my plane was heavy with the torpedo and the masts of the ship were 60 feet high. It took all my skill to pull off that manoeuvre. The torpedo squadrons from Akagi and Kaga were dropping their torpedoes and every time one struck home a huge column of water shot up in the air. It was truly a magnificent sight. As I zoomed over the ship, I could see the American sailors staring up at us. It seemed like they still didn't realise they were being attacked. Sorry, boys, but this is war. As I was flying over Ford Island, I looked to the north and I could see torpedoes from Nakajima's squadron hitting home. That looks like Utah, I thought. I gasped involuntarily as two or three columns of water rose up around the ship. Then, when the fourth torpedo hit, Utah broke in half and turned on its side. From where I was sitting, it was an awe-inspiring sight. But it seemed like a waste of torpedoes. Our pilots had been so thoroughly trained to hit their targets that they put four fish into the Utah and ignored the valuable seaplane tender moored adjacent to it. Soldiers have to follow orders, but in the heat of battle, pilots have to be allowed to make decisions on their own. I made a wide, slow turn and lined up on my target. This would be a piece of cake. I was probably the only torpedo pilot making a second pass. Don't rush it, I told myself. Looking at the ship's superstructure, she looked like California. The only problem was the breakwater about 300 yards away from the ship. If I didn't drop the torpedo just right, it would hit the breakwater. I had to fly a very precise attack pattern. OK, Kato, this time it's for real. Looking back, I could see that Hayakawa had a death grip on his machine gun, ready to ward off any attacking planes. This was his first combat sortie, and I wondered what he was thinking. He's either scared stiff or totally relaxed and treating it like a training mission. By now, the sky was filled with anti-aircraft fire. 
Seems like they finally figured out they were being attacked. The seven flying boats at the west end of Ford Island had been blown up by our dive bombers and were burning fiercely. A towering column of black smoke filled with red flames rose from the area. Buildings and other structures on the wharf made it hard for me to get down low, but I eventually cleared the obstacles and dropped down to about 15 feet over the water. I got the plane completely trimmed and horizontal. At a speed of 130 kits, I closed to within 250 yards of California, held my breath and aimed just below and to the right of the ship's bridge. Ready, let it go. Cato raised his hand and I felt the plane leap skywards as the heavy torpedo dropped away. The torpedo attack was now over. The planes were all arcing away to the left and leaving the area. However, if I went left, it would mean flying through all the smoke and fire over the airfield on Ford Island, so I banked off to the right. Hey, Kato, don't forget to take photos. When we got back to the carrier, the photos would tell the true story. I didn't mind dying in order to fulfil our duty, but if we survived the attack, I wanted to get back in one piece. Hey, Maury, we got her, yelled Kato. Looking back, I could see a huge pillar of water shooting up from California. A direct hit, I thought thankfully. A tremendous feeling of relief came over me as I knew I had made the right decision in not following Nagai. As I was flying along, filled with a sense of accomplishment, I looked off my right wingtip just in time to see one of our torpedo planes burst into flames and arc down towards the harbour. He still had his torpedo and seemed to be trying to crash his plane into a battleship. I wanted to reach out and grab the crew from their doomed plane. When I looked down to see what happened to them, I saw a huge explosion where the plane impacted the bridge of a battleship. 7. It was a perfectly executed suicide dive, probably one of the Akagi or Kaga pilots. If I had seen the plane's number, I would have been able to find out the crew's names. In the heat of battle, it would have been easy for Mori to mistake the seaplane tender USS Curtis for a battleship. Even at this early stage of the war, when everything was going their way, it was not uncommon for Japanese pilots of disabled planes to intentionally crash dive into enemy targets. This photo shows Curtis shortly after being hit by a bomb later in the attack. US Navy looking north, I could see that Wheeler Field was covered by a huge pall of black smoke. Bright flashes marked the spots where our bombs were hitting home. Go get em, I thought to myself with relief. I doubted that even one of the 200 fighters lined up there would get off the ground. Then, as I was egressing the area at a height of about 30 feet, kang, 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 it sounded like a hammer pounding on my plane, and I felt the control stick vibrate in my hand. Yow! screamed Hayakawa from the back seat. Crap, I thought. A fighter must have got us. I looked out and saw that both wings were full of holes and that the slugs had come from below. Anti-aircraft fire. In panic, I looked at our fuel tanks, but they were okay, and the engine was still purring along. But I could smell something burning in the back seat. Hey, Kato, what's burning back there? My seat cushion's on fire. Well, get rid of it. Wondering where the shooting had come from, I looked down and almost fainted. We were flying right over a group of about ten destroyers and cruisers, and they were all shooting at us. We'd flown right through their wall of fire. It's a miracle we weren't shot down. That's what must have knocked down the other torpedo plane. And all we got out of it was a burned seat cushion, the luck of the draw. Someone up there must have been looking over us. As we continued our escape, we flew right over some huge fuel storage tanks. Hayakawa started blasting away at them with his machina gun, but even if he hit them, there was not much his 7.7 million slugs would do to those big tanks. Still, I let him keep firing because it seemed like a fitting way to get even with them for shooting at us, and I'm sure it made him feel good. Hickam Field was also in flames. Our boys had worked it over pretty good. This heavily retouched photo shows a Nakajima B5N Kate exiting the Pearl Harbor area after the attack. According to the original caption, this plane was from the Zuikaku. The USS California is just visible, yet to be struck by Mori's torpedo. 
Our rendezvous point was 20 miles out to sea on a heading of 180 degree islands from the mouth of the harbour and an altitude of 30 feet. As each plane finished its attack, it headed south at low level. We knew about the anti-aircraft guns at the harbour entrance and we were careful to avoid that area. We all wanted to exit the area as fast as possible, so I figured it would be hard to get us all together again. Screaming out of there at 160 Kyotes, right on the deck, the phone poles and buildings whipped by on each side. Still, it wasn't fast enough for me. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. We didn't have anything against the local citizenry, so we tried to avoid flying over Honolulu. Nevertheless, we somehow ended up over the city. Finally, we got out over the water again, and I was able to catch my breath. We made it. I felt very keenly that we had done our duty and survived, and that we would live to fight another battle. We climbed out and headed for the rendezvous. Looking back, I could see flames and black smoke covering Pearl Harbour and the airfields. All was darkness. With the attack over, we now had to get away as quickly as possible. Our fighters would join us later. When we got to 2,500, Hayakawa suddenly yelled, There's a strange aircraft following us. Thinking that it was a plane from one of our other carriers, I casually looked over my shoulder and was surprised to see it was a yellow biplane, an enemy plane. Hey, Hayakawa, get rid of him, start shooting. I'd let my guard down and relaxed because I thought we were in the clear. Now here I was in a big panic. He must have been pretty brave to come chasing after us like that. I realised that we didn't have anything to fear from a biplane and made a steep turn. At the same time, Hayakawa cut loose with a burst. The enemy plane flipped inverted and split est away to the right. If that had been a fighter, we'd soon have been swimming instead of flying. Later I learned that the plane belonged to a local farm, the pilot was just out for a Sunday flight when the attack started, and he was afraid to land while the attack was underway. Our climb-out had brought us up right in front of him, and he was just looking us over. He later said, I found myself right behind a Japanese plane. When they started shooting, it scared the hell out of me, so I got out of there and flew off to the south. He was very lucky that none of our bullets hit him. Watching the yellow plane disappear behind us made me think of my training days at Kasumigawara. My first solo flight was in a plane very much like that. For a brief instant, I had the strange illusion that I was back in the skies over Kasumigawara. Ahead of us were five torpedo planes from the Akagi. It seemed that most of the Soryu planes had already returned to the ship. I couldn't see any of our planes in the air. I hoped that flight leader Nagai and the rest of our men had made it back okay. Because I was the only one to arrive late at the rendezvous point, they were probably worried that maybe I'd intentionally crashed us into an enemy position. Still, the fact that I'd ignored Nagai's orders, gone around for a second pass and changed, my target was probably going to be a problem. We had photographic evidence to back us up, but we still disobeyed orders. Still... Orders or no orders, I couldn't obey an order to mistakenly attack a cruiser instead of a battleship. I throttled up and joined up with the Akagi planes. There were now also five Zeros and three dive bombers with us. There was no doubt that our attack had been very successful. I suddenly realised that the tremendous stress I'd been under since we received our orders and departed Hitokapu had mysteriously vanished. I felt so carefree that I wanted to whistle a tune as we flew along, and before long I was humming a popular song. The skies around Hawaii were wonderfully clear, and reminded me of one of those beautiful cloudless days in Japan. Although I was now feeling very much at ease, I couldn't help wondering about the sailors on those warships we'd sunk. No doubt many were killed or injured. I wondered if I would meet up with any of them in future battles. We were all human beings after all and harboured no special hatred towards each other, yet now we would be killing each other. As soldiers, of course, that couldn't be helped, but to simply explain it all away as a matter of fate seemed rather harsh. I wondered if the radio news in Japan had announced Japan's declaration of war on England and America. Of if they'd mentioned the spectacular results of our attack, 
Of course, there's no way my mother back home could know whether her son was involved in the heroic attack on Pearl Harbor. But I wondered they thought when they heard the news. My daydreaming was suddenly interrupted by Hayakawa. Man, he said, that was really hot. What was? That anti-aircraft slug just missed my ass. It came up right between my shirt and the skin on my back. It was hotter than hell. I don't think I'm hurt, but my back stings. It felt like the badger from Kachi Kachi Yama. Eight clawed his way up my back. Once again, I was reminded how luck and fate held sway over all our lives. If that slug had been just a few inches further forward, it would have gone right through him come out the top of his head, and he would have gone straight to Yasukuni Shrine. Instead of happily humming a tune, I would be mourning the death of my friend. Truly, our lives hung by a thread which could break at any time. We'd now been flying for about ninety minutes. On the horizon I could see a few black specks about the size of small beans. After ten more minutes I saw our fleet. They were heading due west and trailing bright white wakes. A few minutes more, and we were there. My feeling of relief was indescribable. I felt extremely happy. I couldn't wait to get on board and talk to my comrades about our attack. Hey, Kato, we made it! He was peering through his binoculars. Where's Soryu? he yelled. There it is. I see it. I want to let them know we made it back. On board Soryu, they were probably worrying about us. I wanted to get back on board as soon as possible and tell them about torpedoing the battleship. I waggled my wings at the flight leader for the Akagi planes and banked away towards the Suryu. Come on, propeller, I prayed. Spin faster. After descending to 600, we messaged the ship. Captain, we're back. I couldn't see flight leader Negai's plane or the other seven planes on deck, so I assumed that they were already down on the hangar deck. I lowered the gear and got ready to land. There must have been an east wind blowing because the carrier began swinging around to the east and heading in the direction of America. I got a green light for my left gear but no green for the right. The red light for the right gear stayed on. Crap, I thought. Thirty seconds passed, then a minute, still red. It could be a problem with the light. I tried pulling up the left gear and lowering it again. No green on the right. Thinking that maybe there was too little hydraulic pressure, I told Hayakawa to operate the hand pump. He pumped away on it until the cable broke, but the light stayed red. Hey Kato, I yelled. Look through the bomb site and see if you can see anything wrong with the right gear. It's not deployed. Looks like it got shot up. Not surprising, seeing how both wings were full of holes. We were really lucky the engine didn't get hit, or we never would have made it back. By this time, the carrier had turned into the wind and was giving us the OK to land signal. The combination of strong east wind plus the carrier's forward speed made for ideal landing conditions. However, while it was possible to land with only one gear down, there was the risk of fire. That could have serious consequences for us and for the ship. We were running out of time, so I told Hayakawa to signal that we had gear problems and couldn't land. They immediately signalled used to ditch next to one of the destroyer escorts. After faithfully bringing us safely back to the carrier, our plane would now end up at the bottom of the ocean instead of in the carring hands of our mechanics. However, there was no alternative, so we prepared to ditch. Hayakawa wrapped up our code books and other secret documents in a rubber bag. This would be my first ditching, so I was very nervous. I figured the water would stop us very quickly and exert immense pressure on the plane, but I figured if I just relaxed, everything would turn out okay. I pulled up the left gear so we could land flat and flew back alongside the trailing destroyer. When we were down to an altitude of about 60 feet, I signalled them that we were going to ditch. The destroyer crew had rescued ditching aircrew before so they slowed to a stop and launched a rescue boat. I prepared myself mentally for the impact and brought the plane down as gently as possible. Kato seemed pretty relaxed and was bracing himself with both hands on the front of the seat. I descended as gently as possible and set the plane down about 200 feet to the right of the rescue boat. 
As soon as we touched down, I was slammed forward violently, but because I had both feet braced against the instrument panel, it wasn't too bad. I looked behind me and saw that Kato had a little blood on his forehead, but it didn't look too bad. Hayakawa was already in the water, holding the red bag in his hand and yelling, Hurry, Mori! Get out! The plane had already sunk to the level of my seat, and it was time to say a final goodbye to the planey that had served us so well. We'd been through lots of good times and bad Togatha, from training in Japan back in September to the attack on Pearl Harbor. I felt very sad having to part with 332 like this. I wiggled the control left and right as a way of saying sayonara, and for the last time climbed out of the plane that had meant so much to me. The water level was now halfway up the seat. I said one last goodbye, then turned away and jumped into the sea. Although only about twenty seconds had elapsed since we touched down, it seemed like a much longer time. She was nose down in the water and pointing due north of Hawaii as the swells swallowed her up. Our life vests kept us afloat, so we didn't have to do much of anything but wait for the rescue boat to pluck us out. And although it was December, the water wasn't at all cold. It felt like we'd just gone for a swim. I now had the dubious honour of being the first pilot in the strike force to ditch. The rescue boat picked us up quickly and transferred us to the destroyer Tanikaze. Once there, we were taken to the officers' quarters for a warm bath and a change of clothes. Tanikaze, the destroyer that picked up Mori and his crew. She was torpedoed and sunk by USS Harder on June 9, 1944, in Sibuto Passage. Shizuo Fukui after about 30 minutes, the first aircraft from the second attack returned and began landing on their carriers. I was envious of those who'd made it back safely. I badly wanted to see my comrades and talk about the attack with them. I was worried that I might be stuck on this tin can for the entire trip back to Japan. It was like being in someone else's home, and I felt completely out of place. As soon as all the planes had landed, the strike force picked up speed and headed northwest towards Japan in order to clear the area as quickly as possible. While we were on board the carriers, on December 8th, our southern air groups and our submarines attacked the Repulse and Prince of Wales from England's far eastern fleet, but I still hadn't heard what the results were. Those ships were based in the Navy port at Singapore, and their very presence was a threat to our forces so there was no way our air groups could leave them at large. On the carriers, we received various news reports over the loudspeaker system, but apparently this was not done on the destroyers, because when I asked about it, no one seemed to know what had happened. My thought was that we'd done our jobs and wiped out the American fleet, and now we're depending on those guys down south to take care of the English. The morning after the destroyer rescued us was the ninth. We were now far enough away from enemy waters that we no longer had to fear an attack, so battle stations were cancelled and the destroyer returned to normal operations. That afternoon, the destroyer's captain paid us a visit. Glad to see you men are OK, he said to me. How'd the attack go? Pretty good. We torpedoed a battleship. Good work. How about giving a talk to the crew? I'm sure they'd like to hear your account of it. Well, I'm not too good at public speaking, I muttered. No need to be bashful. Just tell them what happened. We can do it right now. I didn't know what to do. The truth was, I wasn't the least bit bashful. I was just terrible at public speaking, especially in front of a crowd. Still, these guys saved us after our ditching, so I felt I owed them something in return. Well, OK, I said reluctantly but let me organise my thoughts and I'll give a talk tomorrow. That got me off the hook for the time being, but I was still unsure of myself. Neither Kato nor Hayakawa were any help at all. They didn't want any part of it. I had no idea what I was going to say. That evening, two scout planes returned to the carrier. Since I'd never seen planes land on a carrier from a destroyer, I thought I might learn something, so I went up on deck to watch. The destroyer followed in the wake of the carrier about 1,000 yards behind and at the same speed. 
When we were landing on the carrier, we used the destroyers as reference points during our approach. If we came over the destroyer at 400 and then turned directly for the carrier, we tended to make nice smooth landings. Although the destroyers were merely support ships for the carriers, we were very glad to have their help. The sun was already setting as the planes landed and the light was fading. From our vantage point, it looked like they'd got on deck without incident. However, the Soryu suddenly made a sharp turn to port. At the same time, the destroyer went to full speed and caught up with the carrier. Launch the lifeboat, came the command, and crew members immediately swarmed around it to prepare for launching. I wondered if a plane had gone in the drink. In fact, that's what had happened. We could now see it bobbing on the swells. I wondered who the crew was. I felt kind of silly just standing there like a spectator. But since I wasn't part of the crew, there was nothing else for me to do. The destroyer raced to the spot where the searchlight was shining and lowered the boat. By this time the plane had sunk out of sight, but I could see the two crewmen floating on the surface. They were soon plucked from the sea and brought aboard the destroyer. From there they were taken to the sick bay for a checkup. It seems they were both badly injured, and the destroyer quickly conveyed this information to Suryu. Suryu then messaged that they were sending a boat over for the injured, and that the three of us would be picked up at the same time. Suryu came to a stop and lowered a boat to come pick us up. We then made the rounds and thanked the captain and everyone else for saving us, and we wished each other good fortune in coming battles. Then, together with the two injured men, we clambered aboard the boat and returned to Soryu. As soon as we were back aboard, I hurried to the officers' quarters to report on our attack. There I saw the many blow-ups of the photos taken from our planes during the attack. So, Mori, what battleship did you attack? When flight leader Nagai and made his attack, I suddenly realised that he was attacking a heavy cruiser, so I quickly switched targets and aimed at a battleship. However, although the distance was sufficient, there was a breakwater in the way and I couldn't drop. So I came around from the arsenal side and attacked the battleship California. We scored a direct hit and I'm sure the ship was seriously damaged. We took photos, but they were lost during our ditching. During my absence, there had been lots of discussion as to whether Nagai had torpedoed a battleship or a cruiser. Even First Lieutenant Heijiro Abe, commander of the Horizontal Bomber Pilots, thought it was too small to be a battleship after looking at the photos. So, in the end, we were vindicated and it was recorded as a cruiser. Although I'd ignored Nagai's orders, my decision proved correct, so our independent action was deemed correct. Even Captain Yanagimoto congratulated us on our success. When we were late in returning, many of the pilots figured we had crashed into an enemy ship or something. So when we finally returned in one piece, they were overjoyed. Our losses on Soryu amounted to 1-0 and my airplane. Other than that, we suffered no damage of any consequence. However, the results of our attacks were also nothing to get excited about. The battleship we had blasted apart was the Utah, a target ship of no real importance. One flight of horizontal bombers scored some good hits and did real damage, but the other didn't achieve anything of significance. Other than that, the only other success was my attack. Overall, our results were somewhat disappointing. When announcing the results of the attack, the Imperial headquarters listed the following achievements. Warships sunk, four battleships, one California class, one Maryland class, one Arizona class, and one undetermined. Two cruisers, or heavy cruisers. One oiler. Heavily damaged, two battleships, one California class, one Maryland class. Two cruisers. Two destroyers, damaged, two battleships, two cruisers, airplanes and shore facilities. Shot down, 14 airplanes. Airplane hangars, 16 burned, two airplanes destroyed. Airplanes destroyed by strafing and bombing. 222 airplanes. Against this, our fleet losses amounted to nine zeros, 15 dive bombers and five torpedo bombers. Our military knew that a surprise attack like this would be very risky, 
so the consequences of possible failure were thoroughly analysed during the planning stages. One of the failure scenarios envisioned our strike force arriving off Oahu only to find the US fleet not in port and then having to slink back to Japan. A more serious concern was that the Americans might learn of the attack in advance and attack the strike force with the combined might of their land-based aircraft and their warships. The latter scenario was expected to inflict heavy damage on the strike force. It was calculated that one third of our carriers might be lost together with more than 200 aircraft. In this case, we would not only not achieve our objective, but would also suffer heavy losses. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor was conceived by Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. However, the plan had many detractors. The main reason was that according to the existing doctrine of air warfare, an attacking force required three times the number of aircraft as the defending force. This would have required many more aircraft than were actually used for the Hawaii operation. However, the Japanese military felt that the operations in the south were more important and were unwilling to allocate more forces for Hawaii. The military knew that the Americans and English were well prepared for war. They were afraid that if they tried to chase two rabbits at the same time, the more important southern operations would be jeopardised. However, Admiral Yamamoto's opposing argument was as follows. If the American Pacific Fleet were to move westwards, that would, of course, interfere with Japan's southern operations, because Japan would have to divert resources to meet that threat. As the enemy forces began conquering the southern islands, they would soon grasp Japan's intentions in that area, and a full-scale war would break out with America. In terms of manpower and war-making capability, there was no way Japan could fight a conventional war with America. This, he reasoned, was why a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor was necessary. The argument was finally settled by Admiral Osami Nagano, chief of the general staff, when he decided in favour of Yamamoto's plan. In any case, we were now at war with America. Remarkably, the attack on Pearl Harbor did in fact catch the enemy completely by surprise, but the next roll of the dice would almost certainly go against us. I didn't know how much longer I would fight in this war, but I was determined to fight as long as I was alive. I wondered how many more hours I would fly. Only the gods knew the answer. All the while, the strike force cleaved boldly through the waves on its way to Japan. Following our successful attack on Hawaii, we were all in high spirits as the strike force continued westward towards Japan. It was then that we received news that made us feel even prouder. In the Southwest Pacific, on the 10th of December, our submarines and land-based aircraft had sunk the supposedly unsinkable British warships Repulse and Prince of Wales. For the second time in a matter of weeks, the world was stunned into the realisation that the era of the battleship was at an end. When the news was announced aboard Soryu, we all jubilantly yelled, Banzai! Our joy knew no bounds, as this meant that the major warships of the American Pacific Fleet and the British Far Eastern Fleet had been, at least temporarily, removed as a threat. This heavily retouched photo shows HMS Prince of Wales and Repulse, lower, under attack by Japanese aircraft. Wikipedia HMS Prince of Wales departing Singapore on December 8, 1941. Two days later, both she and Repulse were on the bottom off the coast of Malaya, sunk by land-based bombers and torpedo bombers. With the sinking of these two capital ships, the primacy of the battleship as a weapon of war came to an end. In all the war, I never received a more direct shock. According to the schedule, we would once again set foot on our beloved homeland on December 23rd. Then the unthinkable happened. On the 16th, orders arrived that the 2nd Carrier Division, Soryu and Hiryu, was to proceed immediately to Wake Island to assist the invasion force. We were dumbfounded. We had narrowly escaped with our lives from one battle zone, and now only our carriers were being sent to another. This was really too much to bear. The 1st and 5th Carrier Divisions were going to return to Japan as planned, but not us. Truly, I thought, I must have been born under a bad star. We all cursed the headquarters, but orders were orders. 
Since there was nothing we could do about it, we eventually resigned ourselves to our ill fortune. According to the report, at the opening of hostilities with America, our forces had attempted a landing on Wake Island. However, the Americans there had put up such stiff resistance that the landing failed. It was further reported that there were between six and eight Grumman fighters stationed on the island's airstrip. Apparently, they were putting up such a fight that our forces had suffered significant casualties. Our job was to go help them. Seen in that light, we couldn't just stand by while our comrades died. Before long, we were all fully committed to doing our part to help. Japanese destroyer Kisaragi, sunk by the Grumman F-4F Wildcats. One bomb hit the ship's stern, where the depth charges were stored, and the ensuing explosion sent the ship to the bottom with all hands. Wikipedia called the Alamo of the Pacific, the American defence of Wake Island, was one of the epic battles of the war. Shown here is the Japanese destroyer Hayate, sunk with all hands by the island's shore batteries during the first Japanese attempt to take the island. So, while Akagi and the other ships in the strike force continued steaming northwest, the ships of the second carrier division hung a left turn and headed south. As we turned away, Akagi sent us a message wishing us good luck. And just like that, we were on our way to a new battleground. On December 22nd, we arrived in the vicinity of Wake. All our men were looking forward to the coming fight. That afternoon, our bombers took off in support of our ships that were bombarding the island. Our dive bombers struck the enemy positions first and were followed by the level bombers. That's most pitiful AA fire I've ever seen, said someone. After Hawaii, we'd all become quite confident. While our zeros covered us so tightly that even water couldn't get through, we took our time and bombed the heck out of the enemy artillery emplacements and other fortifications. It wasn't long before clouds of black smoke began billowing up from the enemy positions. Whatever we'd hit was burning like crazy. Our zeros also managed to shoot down a number of Grummans. That should do it, I thought. Tomorrow they'll be able to land. What was left of the Wildcats on Wake Island after Maury and his squadron mates finished their work? But they went down swinging, sinking a destroyer and shooting down a number of Japanese planes. We landed back on Soryu and were feeling great about the job we'd done. It was then that we received a terrible shock. Petty Officer Saito, one of our most experienced and well-liked pilots, had been shot down during the first bombing attack. Saito, along with his observer Kane, were recognised as one of the best bomber crews in the Navy. The news struck the ready room like a thunderclap, leaving us all in stunned silence. His was the number one plane aboard Soryu. In the training before we departed for Pearl Harbour, Saito had racked up the highest scores of all the level bomber pilots. He had an astonishing direct hit ratio of 100%. The Navy sent him a testimonial naming him best in the fleet, and he received a certificate of merit signed by Admiral Yamamoto himself. Words could not express our sadness. His plane had been leading the nine-plane formation during the attack on the enemy airfield when it was attacked by a Grumman. In an instant, his plane erupted in a ball of fire and slammed into the ocean. But a moment later, the Grumman was also going down in flames the victim of one of our zeros. The revenge was sweet, but our good friend Saito was gone forever. On paper not a match for the faster, more manoeuvrable zero, but in the right hands and with the proper tactics the F4F could hold its own. And unlike the zero, the Wildcat could absorb a tremendous amount of punishment and still bring its pilot home. The next day, the 23rd, at 12.35am, our special naval landing force troops began landing on wake. Nine of our dive bombers and other planes launched in support of the invasion. Just prior to taking off, flight leader Negai had the following words for us. When you get over the island, keep your eyes open. We've received word that the front lines may now be fluid, so be especially careful in your bombing. If we need to observe the ground situation, I'll bank my wings and, Mori, you follow me down. The rest of you stay up there and fly cover. After an hour and twenty minutes of flying, we could just make out the dark shape of the island rising up on the horizon. 
The previous day's two fighter sweeps by our zeros had eliminated all the Grummans, so we weren't worried about being jumped. That was a big relief. Dawn was now breaking, and the sea around the island was a deep cobalt blue. Seen from above, the island looked almost too beautiful to be real. The interior of the island consisted of a large lagoon that looked very shallow. From one corner of this beautiful island roiled a column of black smoke, inside of which were red flames and bright flashes. Viewed from our perch on high, it was hard to believe that Japanese and Americans' troops were killing each other down there. To the west we could see where our landing craft had beached on the island. Some of them were now on fire. It was clear that a desperate battle was underway. There were seven destroyers deployed around the island, and they were all blasting away with their guns in support of the invasion force. It looked like things were going well for our troops. At the southern end of the island I could see a single runway running east and west. That's where the enemy fighters were based that caused us so much trouble. I could see the burned-out hulks of three Grummans on the ground. We dropped lower and flew around the perimeter of the island, and when we got close to the airfield we could see people walking around. I thought that was pretty strange, but just then Nagai rocked his wings and dove, and I followed after him. When we got down to about a hundred and fifty, I saw a line of men marching along. At the front someone was holding what looked like a navy flag. Good work, guys, I thought. Then Kato yelled, There's a white flag flying from the enemy's headquarters. It looked like the enemy had given up the fight and surrendered. Our forces had landed at a single point to the north of the airfield, and it was clear that the fighting had been ferocious. After having to scramble over the dead bodies of their comrades, our troops had finally forced the enemy to surrender. They must have been overjoyed at their success. I was filled with admiration for them, and as I banked low over their positions, I could swear I heard them cheering. After heading out over the ocean, I turned around and flew towards the hill on the other side of the airfield. There was a harbour there, and the water was so clear that even from my altitude of 150, I could clearly see the ocean floor. Just as I made a quick pass over the hill to check the enemy positions there, an anti-aircraft gun opened fire on us. What the hell? I thought. Those filthy cowards are shooting at us. One of the rounds hit my left fuel tank and gasoline began to spurt out. There was about a six-inch hole in the upper surface of the wing. The hole on the underside of the wing was probably small, but after exiting the fuel tank, it ripped a big hole in the duralium material of the wing. The fuel vaporised in the airstream and trailed behind us like a long tail. I was furious, First they show the white flag, then they start shooting at us. I still had my bombs and could clearly see their position. I was tempted to wipe them out. If they were all killed, they'd only have themselves to blame. Don't dish it out if you can't take it, I thought. I was just starting my dive on their position when it occurred to me that if I stayed around to get even, I might not have enough gas to return to the carrier, and I wasn't in the mood for another ditching. I decided that our three lives were more important than their ten or twenty lives. I broke off the attack, and we used hand flags to signal Nagai that we were returning to the ship. We immediately turned away and set course for Soryu. The right tank had one hundred litres, and the left and right auxiliary tanks had fifty litres each, so I had two hundred litres total. We had just enough to make it back to the carrier. As soon as we cleared the island, we dumped the bombs and watched them fall harmlessly into the sea. What a waste, I thought. Must have scared the hell out of the fish. Fuel continued to spew from the hole, and it made me really nervous. If the exhaust ignited the gas when we landed, the ensuing fire would cause a lot of damage to the deck. We might also be incinerated. There were instances in the past where leaking fuel had been ignited by sparks from an exhaust. If fire reached the bombs, there would be a true catastrophe. We finally arrived over the carrier. I was very relieved, but also very concerned about the coming landing. We signalled the bridge that we were making an emergency landing. Soryu was already headed into the wind and ready to receive aircraft. The bridge signalled, clear to land. Fuel was still spurting from the left wing. 
The crew must have seen our situation and the fire crews were probably ready for us. I set up our approach and took us in. Here we go, I yelled. We'll get down, OK? As soon as we touched down, I killed the engine and the plane came to a stop. What a relief. I immediately trotted off to make my after-action report. Shortly thereafter, all of our other planes returned safely. The battle for Wake Island was the toughest fight for our Navy since the war started. Our troops had suffered heavy casualties, but with our help, they had eventually prevailed. Our second carrier division was now finally able to resume its return to Japan, and we headed northwest. At last, on December 29th, we returned to Seiki Harbour in Oita Prefecture. Because carriers only keep aircraft on board while on missions, as soon as we docked, all the planes flew off to land bases for training. Those of us in the attack groups went to Yusa Air Base in Kyushu. For the first time in many weeks, we again breathed the sweet air of our homeland. At Yusa, we learned that we would soon receive brand new airplanes. However, we would have to go to Kasumigara to retrieve them. This was great news. We were all looking forward to getting a newer model with more performance. While we were at our base, we again began training like crazy, but because our planes were now high time and battle-worn, our mechanics had to work constantly to keep them in the air. In three days, it would be New Year's, and we were looking forward to being able to relax and celebrate the holiday. On December 31st, Lieutenant Nakajima and ten of us pilots left for Kasumigara to pick up our new planes. We arrived at Forjos in the afternoon. The December sky was already quite cold, the sun was below the horizon and it was growing dark. The next day would be the first day of the 17th year of Showa. Tonight we would hear the temple bells ringing in the new year at our former home of Kasumigara. We planned to return to Usa the next day, or at the latest, the day after. Excited about getting new planes, we arrived in Kasumigara in high spirits. However, when we asked about them, we discovered that everyone at the base had been so busy getting ready for New Year that they hadn't had time to prepare them. We were miffed. While those of us at the front were giving up our vacations and fighting for our lives, these home air groups were just taking it easy. Even the officer in charge was nowhere to be found. Finally, we just gave up and resigned ourselves to an unplanned vacation. Why don't you guys just take off for a few days, we were told. You've been fighting hard and need a rest. Getting some time off was great, but we were still worried about our airplanes. Still, there was nothing any of us could do about it, so Nakajima just told us, why don't you guys just clear out and come back on the 4th? This took us completely by surprise, but the shock quickly turned to joy, and we immediately set out to spend New Year's Eve in town. As soon as I got there, I checked the time. It was 7.30. If I hurried, I could just catch the last train to Ueno. I ran to Tsuchira Station, jumped on board the train for Ueno, and a few minutes later I was on my way to pay an unexpected visit to my family. When the local train finally arrived at the station out in the Saitama countryside, it was almost midnight. The station was almost deserted, the buses weren't running, and walking home would take more than two hours. Hoping to find a car, I made my way to the only taxi stand and explained my predicament. So desu ne, said the attendant. Our only cab is due to return pretty soon, but it's already reserved. It's taking Mayor Kashiwagi to Naguri. Why don't you ask him if you can ride along? He was the mayor of the neighbouring town. I'd never even seen him before, but figured it wouldn't hurt to ask. Before too long... An older gentleman with a benevolent face came strolling up, who looked every inch a mare. I blurted out an awkward self-introduction, told him that I'd unexpectedly been given a four-day leave but was now stranded at the station. Of course, I couldn't go into long-winded explanations about how we didn't get our airplanes due to the negligence of the supply office. Ah, Sodeska, he said. You guys have been doing a fine job. Of course you can ride with me. I'll have the driver take you to your place. His kind words made me so happy that I thought I would cry. While we waited for the taxi to arrive, he asked me about the war. 
I didn't want to sound like I was bragging, but I didn't conceal anything either. Really, he exclaimed, a California-class battleship? The mayor seemed so impressed with everything I said that I was becoming embarrassed. Before long, our taxi arrived. During the 25-minute drive, he questioned me non-stop about the war. He seemed so interested in everything I said that my fatigue was soon forgotten as I related my many adventures at the front. However, I was careful not to mention any classified information. By the time we arrived at my house, it was 1am, but because it was New Year's Eve, everyone was still up. When I turned up at the front door completely unannounced, my mum stared vacantly at my face in the dim light of our porch light, as if she had no idea who I was. But as soon as they realised it was me, the house erupted in pandemonium. Of course, I had no idea that I would be able to visit them, and apparently they were afraid that I might never return at all. For me, the thought that I would once again eat the traditional New Year's dish of a zoni with my family was like a dream come true. I was at a loss for words, and my mum and the other members of our family seemed completely taken aback by my sudden and unexpected appearance, as if they had no idea what to do. Hey, how about a bath? said someone. Yeah, and bring some sake and chopsticks. Only at 3 o'clock a.m., seeing how tired I was, did they reluctantly let me go to sleep. The next morning was New Year's Day. Our village was so small that it wasn't long before everyone knew of my arrival. A number of other men from our village had joined the Navy, and their parents peppered me with questions regarding their loved ones. After visiting our Shinto shrine, I spent the rest of the day and that night relating my wartime experiences until I was literally dizzy from non-stop talking. The next day I made the rounds of our relatives and friends. It wasn't until the third day that I finally got a good night's sleep. I woke up sometime in the afternoon. It felt wonderful to be home again. I was quite convinced, however, that I would probably never again see my home and family. That thought made me feel indescribably lonely. The next day, when saying my goodbyes, I smiled as best I could, but I was weeping inside. When I got back to Kasumigara, I was surprised to learn that there were no airplanes for us there after all. We were told to go to Yokosuka Air Base. Geez, I thought, can we ever win a war doing things like this? Feeling thoroughly disgusted, we trundled off to Yokosuka. When we got there, we got another surprise. There's no new planes for you. Just take the ones we've been using for training. Now we were about ready to break down and cry. This was really too much. Still, the planes looked newer than our old ones, so we reluctantly flew them back to our base at Yusa. In any case, there was no point in getting all worked up about something we couldn't do anything about. Our only job was to do our duty. While we were enjoying New Year's at our homes, in the East and in the West, the war ground on without interruption. On January 3rd, our forces took Manila. Most of the Philippines were now under our control. Manado in the Celebes fell to our forces on the 22nd, after completing the maintenance on our newly acquired planes on January 13th, our carrier group headed in the direction of Davao towards a new battleground. Our provisional orders were to fly patrols in the South Seas and to continue training. Cruising at a speed of 15 knots, we entered the military port of Palau on the 18th. The attack planes from Soryu transferred to the airfield on the island of Peleliu, the southernmost of the Palau Islands. This island was made entirely of coral and had a single runway running east and west. The conditions at this so-called airbase were very primitive. Our billet was a shack built on stilts in the tropical fashion. It had a raised floor that made the extremely humid climate somewhat easier to endure. As soon as we arrived, a large tent was erected to serve as our headquarters and ready room. Only five days earlier, we had been complaining about how cold it was as we tramped the streets of Yusei with the collars on our coats turned up. Now we were wearing short sleeves and short pants and complaining of the heat. When we got thirsty, we drank hot water, but all this did was make us sweat more. We never seemed to stay in one place long enough for our bodies to adjust. 
That night, at least, we got a good sleep in our newly assigned quarters. The next day, we began patrolling a 300-mile radius around our airfield. Day after day, all we did was fly patrols. Of course, this was also one of an attack plane's tasks, but compared with the excitement of torpedoing ships and dropping bombs, it was terribly boring. After two and then three weeks of staring at empty expanses of ocean for three hours and forty minutes every day, we were about ready to tear our hair out. As if the flying wasn't boring enough, there was nothing to do on the island, and of course there were no entertainments of any kind. We were soon thoroughly sick of it all. Still, when munching on exotic tropical fruits or snoozing in the shade of a coconut tree, life on these southern isles didn't seem too bad. In Japan, bananas were an expensive luxury food, but here we could eat our fill. Even coconut milk, which at first smelled rather awful, soon became one of our favourite beverages. We also developed a taste for copra. The most serious problem was a lack of water. Since it was a coral island, there was no fresh water even if we had dug for it. We relied entirely on rainwater that ran from the roof gutters directly into a large tank. We used this water both for drinking and for washing our faces. Sometimes there was mosquito lava in it. Fortunately, during the time we were on the island, there were squalls almost every day, so we never suffered from a lack of water. However, like life on board the ship, water was carefully rationed. The tropical nights lit by moonlight were breathtakingly beautiful. When the moon was full, it seemed a shame to squander such beauty with sleep. One evening, for the first time in a long time, we were given a bottle of sake. There was no place to drink in our quarters, so Nonaka, Ando and I decided to have a moon viewing party out on the airfield. There was an observation platform there that was about 30 feet high. Hey, how about up there? said Ando. Yeah, we'll get a better view of the moon. Everything looks better when viewed from above. We were supposed to be in our bunks by eight, so if we got caught we'd probably get in some trouble, but by the time eight o'clock rolled around we were no longer worried about such things. We'd also managed to scrounge up some canned clams that we snacked on while drinking. At first we were careful to be quiet and stay out of sight. However, the more we drank, the louder we got, and before long we were having quite a party up there. Hey, Mr. Guardman, you've stood watch all day, better get a good night's sleep, we joked. If the moon were a mirror, what stories it would tell, sang Ando. Before long, we were singing the old song about seducing the village headman's daughter. She was a dusky maiden that South Sea's beauty. We were having so much fun that we soon lost all track of time. Hey! someone yelled. What the hell's going on up there? Uh, oh, I thought. Looks like they found us. Get down from there! Okay, okay, we said meekly as we climbed down the ladder with the now almost empty sake bottle. What were you guys doing up there? said the guard. Well, the full moon was so beautiful that we thought we'd have a moon viewing party. You guys got a mission tomorrow. Get to bed and get some sleep. Okay, okay. He wasn't scolding us, and when I looked closer I recognised Shichiro Yashiro, the senior guard snickering in the background as they sent us back to our quarters. Our daily 300-mile patrols in the oppressive heat continued as usual. One day when I was off duty and dozing in the tent that was our ready room, an urgent telegraph came in from one of our patrols. Six enemy submarines, headed due north, 180 to Gay, 150 miles. We're shadowing them. Everyone sprang into action, and we prepared to launch an attack. Each plane was quickly armed with two 60 kilos depth charges. The sections took off individually and headed off to attack the subs. Like everyone else, I rushed off, got my flight gear on, and ran out to the field. But when I got there, my airplane was gone. One of the maintenance men came up to me grinning sheepishly and handed me a piece of paper. On it was scrawled in pencil, My airplane's no good, so I took yours. That damn Nagai, I thought. I'm just a couple of minutes late and he makes off with my airplane. <laughs>